Hello and welcome to the new season of the Coaching Manual podcast hosted by me, Danny Mills. Today I'm joined by former Brentford, Glasgow Rangers, Nottingham Forest manager, Mark Warburton. Mark has a background in professional football going back to his playing days in the late 70s an apprentice at Leicester City and the 80s as a semi-pro at Enfield and Boreham Wood with the highlights being an FA Trophy and a conference title. In this episode, we'll be talking about some of Mark's experiences, both as a player and as a manager, and what makes his football journey quite unique. So, Mark, thanks for coming on. Uh, welcome to the TCM podcast. I mean, it's really interesting for us so far. I've interviewed John Greening, Neil Sullivan, and without being disrespectful, were, were footballers turned coaches, you know, and a lot of that was about their career you've sort of gone about it a different way completely and you're the first proper coach, if you like, um, that I would say that, that we've had on. But if we go right back to the beginning, I mean, what got you into football uh, originally as, as a young kid? I was a, I was a young kid, as, as we all are, loving the game, playing the game, school, Sunday teams, etc. Every minute of every day. Um, but I was lucky to be good at sports, Danny. So for me, it was a, a choice between running and, and football. Uh, I was very lucky that, that I came across Frank McClintock uh, his son Neil was my best friend at school. Frank was leaving Arsenal, going to Leicester City, if you remember, as a manager. Uh, and I was coaching with Leicester City, or training with Leicester City rather, from 14, 15 upwards, uh, and got offered a scholarship, a young apprenticeship, and, and accepted that. So that was my route into, into fo- full time football. And from there, I mean, how difficult was it not to. Every kid had those dreams, obviously, going to be a professional, playing at the top level. How hard is it when that didn't quite happen for you? It was difficult, but um, this sounds very profound for a 16, 17-year-old, but I was working with the very famous manager, Jock Wallace, uh, and Jock's style was you know, obviously very successful, huge success in Scotland with Rangers, etc. Um, but for me, I found it quite really abrasive, uh, and I, I didn't enjoy my football, which for me was a totally alien feeling. I'd always loved, loved my sport, loved everything, everything about sport, uh, and for the first time in my life, I found myself been put off football and thinking that I wanted that if ever I got into the game ever going forward I would act differently uh, and was that the environment was too fierce players were too uh, abrasive uh, no the, I, I the, d- the energy everything really I just found it I don't want to come across as a, as a weak hearted so I, I love the competitive side of, of all sport but I just didn't enjoy that environment that was created and as I say it sounds very profound for a young guy but I thought whatever I do going forward I'm going to work in a different environment than this and, and that's obviously you've taken those lessons on into to later life and, and into your the way you coach now, I assume. Yeah, very much so. But more also, I had a different career in the city, as you know. And, and even there, it's about the quality of environment that you create. It has to be an environment that is conducive to people learning and developing. And that's not just football, that's whatever line of industry you're in. So that was a key, a very early lesson for me, but one that I heeded right the way through. Because it was while you, was playing, you were playing semi-professional, uh, non-league football at Enfield, that you... Well, not switch careers, uh, but became a currency dealer, which I suppose is a is a big shift from suddenly going from wanting to be a professional footballer to suddenly working in the market, uh, working in the in the city, uh, and, and doing those sort of transactions. H- how, how did that come about? Was that something you got through education or parents or advice from somebody else? In truth, it was my mum looking at an advert in the paper, and it read "competitive individual, good with numbers." That was the <laughs> advert, and uh, I was very competitive, and I was very fortunate to be good with numbers. So. Um, it's in a natural a natural role and you have to go through it again two or three years in the bank of, of getting the teas and the coffees and the sandwiches and locking up the telexes and doing all the menial jobs but learning but it was a really competitive environment and any footballer I know would love that competitive trading environment you know, big sums of money um, very competitive testosterone filled environment um, big rewards if you did well and if you didn't do well you were sacked so I like that black and white clarity uh, and I really enjoyed it and I had, a, I had 20 odd years in the city where the market's getting bigger. Um, I was lucky to do quite well and to move up to, to the bigger banks and the bigger environments and, and really enjoyed that. And is there a big similarity then between the two, you know, working in that incredibly testosterone fueled, high pressure environment in the city, um, obviously in, in banks and, and dealing with currency and equally in football? And, and have you managed now to sort of marry the two together uh, and bring both together and get the best out of yourself doing it that way going forward. Yeah, very much so. If you look at a, a dealing room, you know, you would sit there on a desk of 12, 15 people, um, very competitive. And I'm assuming majority of males. 
back uh, then they as well. were but as as you progress through the city you know you're working at places like aig for example a very diverse workforce um talents ideas experiences and uh, again learn a lot from that in that environment but uh, yeah you're right originally early on in the in the career was very much a, a male dominated environment communication was key teamwork was key long hours work ethic demanded uh, and you had to be competitive you had to deal with adversity you know you could work all day or work all year and lose it lose it in one hour um, so you had to deal with that side of it and to me that was a dressing room walk into 12 15 guys in a dressing room competitive etc obvious rewards if you do well and, and, and if you don't do well you, you pay the price accordingly so the similarities for me very 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 obvious uh, and it was a fairly easy transition to move from one world to the other you still had a love for football while you were working in the city always always and uh, I was very fortunate to work in Charlotte North Carolina to live and work in Chicago and, and travel around Asia etc uh, and wherever I went I would look to coach teams whether it's an under nine girls team or a college team or a high school team just coaching um, oblivious to coaching badges had no idea they even existed but just love working with young players and, and developing players so as I say very fortunate to do that and when I came back to the UK in early 2000 realized that actually level one two and three existed and what you have to do so what was the trigger for wanting to get back into full-time football and, and have we'll go back to I suppose where you started I, um, I, I always loved sport and um, you, you turn around to me and quite rightly you would say that 20 odd years in the city suggest you don't love sport enough but I always love sport love being outside competing coaching etc um, was, was there a moment you suddenly thought I want to go back into football yeah. you know that that's what I've done well in the city but this is my love this is what I want to go back to and, and be successful at <laughs> honestly yes there was a moment where I'm sitting there thinking I've done well done okay for myself in the city um, I had two young children um, and, and I really enjoyed I wanted to get do something in football but my thought process was A get myself qualified B improve my depth of knowledge I couldn't go into it without having a, a, a broader depth of knowledge and, and C, saying, well, I need to be financially secure for my family. I couldn't take this sort of jump, this leap of faith, uh, have their backing without giving them the financial security. So I was getting all the eggs in order, so to speak, and, and that came about, and I just wanted to do it. And my son was a, a young uh, boy, invited to go and train at Watford. Um, money was tight at Watford at the time, and they asked me to come and, and help on a part-time basis. And I found myself one day working at RBS with a huge trade coming in, a huge dolly in trade coming in. And I literally said, hang on a second, when I was doing a passing drill on a bit of paper for the under 13s that <laughs> night. And, and that was it. And I came and I said to my wife, and she said, I think it's time to leave. And she was dead right. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't combine at that level, you couldn't combine both. Um, so I made, took the plunge and um, spent the best part of a year traveling around Europe, visiting the academies, trying to learn more, improve my knowledge, all age, what worked well, what didn't work well, because I, I wasn't comfortable going into an environment, certainly not full time, without that broader depth of knowledge. And, and is that the most difficult thing? Because obviously, Maurizio Sarri now, we all know, is a banker um, and hasn't followed the, the standard path of coaching, but obviously has been very, very successful. Was that, all those experience before that, was that a hindrance or a help going into sort of a, a different environment and, and the football environment especially? Because I, I know how harsh players are. And, and how, was, how difficult was it to get that respect uh, from players early on? It was an absolute help. You know, that's the first question because... Um, yeah, if you're in the city, for example, you'd, you'd cold call customers. You'd go and speak to them. You'd get rebuffed. You had to go back. And why should they choose you? And you had to sell yourself and the company you work for and, and why you'd benefit them, etc. So in terms of the clubs, I cold call clubs and I got rebuffed from the first five, six, seven clubs. And it was a good friend at Sport in Lisbon, who's become a good friend rather, who let me come over. Um, and from there, I ended up spending a lot of time with Sport in Lisbon, introduced me to Ajax, etc. But to have that, uh, to be comfortable speaking to people, um, to developing relationships and to understanding that it has to be two-way and everyone must benefit, uh, that really that really helped me, really helped me. So I was able to take that in there and broaden that knowledge and that was very, very beneficial for me. And <coughs> was it difficult to earn the respect of players, even young players, having not had the sensational sort of career that we've seen some, you know, moving now into coaching? Is, is it difficult to earn that respect? It is. Uh, I started in the academy. So again, what players want, I'm sure you would agree, they want to enjoy what they do. So your sessions have to be um, educational, they have to be enjoyable, they have to have structure to them, and there has to be a clear plan in place for the, for the players individually and as a team. And, and uh, I, I recognised that really early and made sure, I did a lot of work to make sure that every single session was maximised. In terms of earning respect, when you move up towards first team players, 
I haven't got the, the playing career of someone like yourself, for example. So how do I counter that? Well, players... Because I look at that and, and, okay, it's a little bit old school, but someone coming in without a playing background, the players would have been, what does he know? Yeah. You know we, and we had it with sports scientists or whatever it was. There, there's always that arrogance of players and that togetherness is like, well, actually, if we don't really like him, we can force him out on that issue. Is that difficult to overcome even with young yeah. players? So, so how do you earn the respect? So in terms of first team players, you know, I, my assistant manager, huge respect for Davy Weir who has an outstanding playing career. So in terms of first team players, that obviously was a, a key question answer because David's been and done it at every level. Um, but from my point of view, I took the players at Brentford into the HSBC dealing room. I, I took them in there to say, this is the world I come from. This guy here is turning over to two and a half billion dollars a day, not million, billion dollars a day. He's 28, for example, and this is the pressure he's under. And I did that for 20 years. Uh, and you talk to them and suddenly they realise because players are impressed not, yeah, in a, yeah. not in a shallow way <coughs> but they're impressed by the finance and the money and, the, oof, and success know, as well and success and, and you don't, you've, you've done well you've competed in a completely alien world highly competitive and you've been successful so I got their attention that way um, and, and communicating with the players putting in place bonus structures the owner at Brentford very very forward thinking very innovative and, and an aggressive bonus structure for the players a bit like the city if you do well you get rewarded and as a player you know that you know, if every point is up for grabs, every goal is up for grabs, and you're going to strive to be the best you can be. So that that's how I got that respect and, and touch wood. It worked well. How did that opportunity to work at Brentford come about? Obviously, you were at Watford before that. I was at Watford um, <coughs> from 2004 onwards. Uh, got to academy manager, worked with some very, very good people. That's Avady Boothroyd, Malcolm Mackay, Sean Dyche, Dick Bate, Keith Mincher, etc. Some some top people. Um, Left Watford and uh, I think Matthew made a change in the managerial front. I think Andy Scott left the club and I got a phone call middle of the night when I come and coach the first team in the morning. Uh, I was up all night learning the players' <laughs> names on the internet, literally. Um, but that was an opportunity uh, and Matthew's, uh, it was a privilege to work for him for the best part of five years. Um, coached the team for six months. We were 18th in League One. I think we finished 10th. Uh, I applied for the managerial job and he appointed Uwe Rosler and asked me to become uh, technical director which I did for the next two years and, and thoroughly enjoyed that in terms of learning so much about the game and agents, academy. And, um, and then when Uwe left to go to Wigan, I was offered the, the job and very thankful for it. Obviously, Matthew Benham, by all accounts, you, you know him far better than I do, but obviously made a, a lot of his money via, via betting. But he seems to be a big advocate, maybe through that of statistics, analysis, almost money ball to effect. Do you buy into a lot of that or is that a lot of sort of smoke and mirrors when it no, comes to I, football? I learnt an enormous amount from Matthew, huge respect, um, a very, very smart, forward-thinking guy, as I said, um, but he, he looks at the game in a different way, and uh, as I said, everything he said, he can, he can teach you so much about the game, you will, you know, one thing Matthew always used to speak about was never run the ball into a corner, if you're one up with five to go, that's the last thing you should do mathematically, the stats tell you this. Now, 99% of every single professional player would say at five, you know, if you're one up with five <laughs> to go, you run it into the corner. Or no, and you look at it and he has the stats to back it up and everything he spoke to you about would be supported by numbers. Um, and it is a balance, absolutely it's a balance. It's not all about the numbers, it is a, a balance, but there's no doubt that when you have someone as astute as that, you can learn so much and hopefully you can add your, your experiences to the equation as well and overall you get a really strong product. Were there, were there any disagreements you had on that? It's really interesting, I, I spoke to Sean Dyche about that and, and you know he's very analytical and all those sort of things maybe coming through this sort of similar sort of way but actually he said sometimes it doesn't work you know when the the wing back has tracked back and he's run 70 yards and he hasn't made a tackle but he stopped across and it doesn't show up on the stats yeah. do you ever have to go to the owner and go yeah they're great but sometimes they don't quite work because of this no I mean it's <coughs> when you say money ball I'd imagine Matthew Benham is money ball times 10 you know, in the touches of level that they work at. And uh, there are examples that you can highlight, but in, in truth, it's all about probability. Uh, and you look at what increases the percentage of, of scoring goals, the quality of chances that you create, um, and the likelihood of goals, you know, c coming from, from those chances. So uh, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that when I spoke to Neil Sullivan, uh, and he said, you know, when, when they were even at Wimbledon, they were very, very similar. And he said, they were quite advanced for their years. He said, right, if we get 100 crosses into the box, we're going to score 10 goals. And it, and it was simplified. So if they come off a game and said, well, actually, we've only put 30 crosses in, we're not going to score enough goals. 
you know, that's it. I mean, Matthew's team will be able to say to you that if you if Danny's got the ball when he shoots in 25 yards out, the likelihood of you scoring a goal the li- is... The likelihood it's gone over the stand first and foremost. That, that aside. Um, but the likelihood of you scoring would be X percent. If you then carried on and played a 1-2, for example, and you entered in the box, you're now 16 yards out, the likelihood is now this. And it's just about the, the probability of you actually scoring from all, all of what has been done. Possession's irrelevant. You can have 95% possession. It's irrelevant if you're not attacking and creating chances. Um, and so you learn, as I say, going back to Matthew, I learned an awful lot in that period. Um, and as I say, we had some talented teams, uh, talented players rather, uh, and we had a really good run and, and just missed out on the Premier League, which is unfortunate. But a good crop of young players who benefited from a variety of experiences and, and, and not, not the least, obviously, Matthew's input. The sporting director role in England especially, is, is relatively new. You know, we, we had a few where it was ex-managers getting involved and then actually they wanted the managerial job or they wanted the head coach's role. Is that changing now? Is, is the technical director role becoming unique on its own rather than just a, an ex an ex manager being a friend of the owner or, or somebody like that. I think it's getting far more fine tuned, Danny. I think it's a, a crucial role for any club. Obviously the higher levels of championship and, and the Premier League especially. Um, obviously because of the budget constraints at the smaller clubs. But I think it's a position which can can continue to grow quite rapidly. I think the responsibilities will be clarified going forward. I think at the moment, even the title, technical director, sport and director, head of football business, what really is the title? What are the roles and responsibilities associated with it? What comes under your command? The lines of communication, etc. All of these key points are being clarified almost by the week within the various clubs. I think it's a position that will assume so much significance uh, going forward but above all else that p- that position has to have an outstanding relationship with the manager if you're the technical director and I'm the manager we've got to get on and I think that's been the problem in the past hasn't it where that in the early days in England especially the, the technical director there was competition between the head coach and it was like well actually as soon as he has a bad spell I'll have the managerial role it's about trust it's about respect and honesty and I think uh, any good manager any good coach will want to have clear opinion he doesn't want a yes man there, but it's how you deliver that opinion. And he needs to know that the technical director has always got his best interests at heart. And that's really important. If you're the go-between, for example, between the manager and the board, you know, the, the quality of your communication, the clarity of message, um, the, all of these aspects, the manager has to know that you've got his back at all times. Which would you prefer moving forward? Technical director, head coach? I think for, for me personally, and probably I've, I've been very fortunate to, to manage at some, some big clubs, uh, very much enjoyed it. We've had some success, promotions and playoffs, etc. I uh, I just want a job personally whereby you can be successful. And that, that sounds vague, so if I can clarify that. I think it's important to have a job whereby you have some uh, some time to do the work. I think that's the key, some longevity to a position. I look at some managerial jobs now uh, and you're just so disheartened. When you see people go in three, four, five months and under pressure after seven, eight games, it's ludicrous, but it's a game we work in now, and we've got to try and work hard to find a solution to that. Um, but right now, I just want a job personally where you have a chance to be successful. And if you fail, you put your hand up and say, and say accordingly. But um, I think that, that one word of time is the key, Danny. You're listening to the Coaching Manual podcast, hosted by me, Danny Mills. Obviously, after your time at, at Brentford, you took a, a huge job uh, here in the UK, which was obviously the Glasgow Rangers job. Mm-hmm. Massive opportunity. I think we all see it as there's only two clubs in Scotland. Um, effectively, there's not. We know that. Um, it's bigger than that. But, I mean, the old firm, your first old firm derby, you know, everyone talks about the atmosphere. C- can you describe almost the week leading up to that and, and then the, the game itself? It, it is. It's a level of passion which I don't see replicated down south. And I'm a, I'm a you know London boy, to me, Tottenham Arsenal was the biggest game of the season or the biggest game ever. Uh, and then you realise the, what the old firm entails, what it means to the city. It literally is half and half. Um, and the build-up really is you know, days and days before. Um, and the actual game itself, the, my first old firm game was a, a semi-final against Celtic uh, at Hamden, which we won on penalties. But it, had a, it was a game that had everything, but the atmosphere was incredible. Um, but you knew you had a level of responsibility. So as a, as a manager, a staff member, uh, and as a as a player, you have a huge responsibility because it means so much to so many people in the city. You've played in some huge derbies, but as I say, up, up, up in Glasgow, so much is at stake. And, and to win that game after where Rangers had been in the previous two or three years, it, it meant so much to the fans. That was a, a fantastic occasion. You know, one will stick long in the memory. Um, 
the first league game was at Parkhead, 65,000. Uh, and we had a tough result there. Um, they scored two late goals. But an atmosphere, Brendan came over, was quite unlike anything you've ever experienced. I was trying to speak to Barry Mackay, who was five yards away, yelling at him. He couldn't hear a word I was saying. Such was a level of noise. And it's different down south because it goes on for the full 90 minutes. It just doesn't stop. And again, irrespective of winning, losing, it's a privilege to be involved in those, in those type of games. It was a difficult time for Rangers. <clears throat> How difficult was it, one, to manage on the field stuff uh, and also to manage off the field stuff as well? There was an awful lot of change going on at the club at, at that time and a, and a period where they hadn't been successful for, for quite a few years. No, I mean, firstly, Rangers is a magnificent football institution you know, with a, with a proud and long history, as we, as we all know. At the time we went in, David and I, they, there was nine players on the first day of pre-season. I think 13 had been released uh, and literally we had a bare bones of a squad so that was the task facing us, but that's a, an opportunity as well. So to be able to bring in the likes of, of Tavernier, Fodringham, you know, Rob Keenan, Waghorn, um, uh, Danny Wilson, Halliday, how all these young guys, majority of them all three, we had the money was and, tight. And was, was that difficult blending them into a team exceptionally quickly? We, we've seen often managers and coaches struggle where there's a lot of signings coming over the summer through their own choice. You had to do it through necessity. W was it difficult to, it, to merge them into a team very it, quickly? No, because, I'm not saying it in an arrogant way, because we had some experienced wise heads, the likes of Kenny Mill and Lee Wallace, who I can't speak highly enough about those two guys, by the way, two outstanding pros. Um, but to get young guys in, uh, we wanted people who were hungry and enthusiastic and keen to learn. Um, and, and the likes of Tavernier, we saw Rother Rotherham, his quality of delivery and his athleticism, for example. Keenan, a, a proven championship centre-half, was foddering him 170-odd game for Swindon. So we knew we had experience, we had players who liked to play football, and we had players who wanted the ball at their feet, and, and that's what we were after. So that, that hunger, passion, enthusiasm, and a desire to, desire to learn and improve. And we got that, as I say, mentored by the wise old heads. Um, and, and it went really well. We started off strongly, Danny, and, and we had a good season. You've obviously been around a, a lot of big clubs. After that, you went to Nottingham Forest, a, another club steeped in history. Um, obviously, you know, Brian Clough and, and the era and, and all that sort of stuff. You're a double European Cup winners, mm -hmm. uh, effectively. But, you know, you can hear the, the, the passion in your voice for football and everything else. To pass that on, what advice can you start giving to, to younger coaches coming through? And I think it's important because there are a lot of coaches out there that didn't play the game professionally, that didn't have those opportunities, that played at a level that you played at. And actually that can be quite inspiring that you went on to be very, very successful having not had that so-called prestige mm -hmm. playing career. I think the key, I get I get so many messages, be it Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever, from, from young coaches whose passion for the game is, is evident in every word that they write down. But I hear them say, you know, I'm, I've done my level two now and I want to go into full-time football. I get it all the time. I got one yesterday. I'm a level one coach looking to go full time football, and you're trying to say that one, you've got to appreciate the industry, in terms of the number of people who want to be involved in the the national game, the global game, uh, and you've got to appreciate the work that's involved for you to have any chance of being successful. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying like an old man here, but it was hard work, Danny. You know, it really was hard work. Long hours in the academy at Watford, for example, you do your 85, 90 hour weeks. Your day off was Sunday afternoon after the academy games, and you're back on the Monday morning and um, it's a slog, you know, and, and you have to put the time in, you have to gain the experience and you have to improve your depth of knowledge. I would never dream on a level one or level two to say I'm going to become a full-time football player, uh, fo football coach. Um, but you, you have to acknowledge it now. So what I'd, uh, my advice would be to recognise um, recognize the industry, understand what it would take to get into a full-time position and give yourself some, some short-term, medium-term targets. So are you working with under 13 level of player? What are you doing with that particular squad you're working with? What are your aims with this squad? What represents success for this squad? Uh, and, and at those young ages, is it more technique-based rather than anything else, get them to improve and, and get those skills at a level so they can then perform the, the challenges and the, and the wider coaching sessions that you want to put on? It's understanding what's involved in being a coach. You know, I was very fortunate to have to work with Dick Bate, who in my mind was the best coach educator ever, uh, a man, f a font of knowledge, but he would demand of you every day. If your, if your message wasn't clear enough, if your coaching uh, message wasn't delivered in the appropriate manner, he'd pull you up uh, and you need that level, you need that constant you know, drive to, to understand the demands of the game because players at your level, players need to have knowledge. 
uh, and if they think that you're you have holes in your knowledge they'll pick them out very very quickly so you have to make sure you cover all bases so is th is that going is that difficult do you think I'm, i've i've done my coaching or a certain level of coaching badges and, and coaching it's so it is so different from playing you know and even when as i got sort of senior part of my career i coached what i would say on the pitch from a playing perspective and other players it is so different from putting on a session starting stopping a session is this the biggest thing that the likes of Gerard Giggs, uh, Lampard, Barton, Sol Campbell, is that their biggest challenge in, in actually how they're going to coach rather than, they, they've got the knowledge, I assume, but actually how to coach, the language they use is going to be the biggest challenge for them. I think uh, obviously they're, they're world-class players, you know, outstanding playing careers and they've now got to take their ideas and their knowledge into their coaching, as you, as you just said. So how do they get their message across? How do they understand how players arrive at a certain point you know, from A to B etc and what's involved in that journey and what do you have to do to work with the players because I'm sure many things came quite naturally to those players as talented young kids coming through the academy etc you know young Frank Lampard or young Stephen Gerrard making a debut at 16 17 years of age uh, obviously they worked really hard uh, and maximized their talent but a lot of it must have come quite easy to them to to progress on to first in level so quickly now when you're at Rangers or you're at Derby County for example what's the right time to progress these players? What do they need to do to improve their game? And I'm sure what they will do is surround themselves, Stephen, with Gary McAllister, etc. Getting good people around them, Jody Morris around Frank, um, getting good people, good coaches around them to help them deliver their message. But it's that clarity of message I think they'll, fight, they'll have to work out for themselves going forward uh, and how best they can maximise the knowledge they've gained, they've gained from working under some outstanding coaches. And, and is that the most crucial point for them especially for the young players that they're dealing with you just mentioned when they came through they probably found it quite easy for them is it deciding when they are good enough to step in to the first team shoes yeah. and, and step into that regime and also when to pull them out you know you can step in for three four five games and then you come out for two or three and so I look at um, Mason Mount for example now so it's on loan from Chelsea and and Frank has a huge responsibility there to look after that young player who's doing great for him but a great for Mason to be working with someone like Frank Lampard but it's maximising that situation and making sure that uh, his Mason's playing time and minutes on the pitch is appropriate for his development. He's being challenged in the right way each and every day. And Stephen, likewise, taking some very talented young, young loanees. Getting those, getting those uh, messages right to the players is key, critical, because at this stage of their career, when one wrong, one wrong move here could really hurt them. So it's, it's, it's imparting their knowledge that they've gained over their playing careers to make sure they benefit their young star that's coming through now. And I'm guessing some of the advice you know, for them planning their sessions, knowing what they're going to do, having a, a pathway that they want to go down. And this is for all coaches, I assume. How important is it to have your day, your week, your month, all of that planned out in advance, just in case? Everyone will, will tell you a different story. My, for me personally, it's absolutely critical. You know, I was quite uh, fastidious in this. I would, I would plan out, this is what I want my, my players to be doing by the end of the season. It, it, does that come from your academic background or football or, or a mix of both I've always been that way I've always I've always liked planning and structure so uh, if you start the season where do I want the players to be at Christmas where do I want them to be in March where do I want them to be at the end of the season how am I going to get there what do I have to do now to help help allow that to happen uh, and I, I love that planning and structure I'd, I'd write all the sessions out weeks ahead and key points I want to see but I also knew that I couldn't just work through the whole session if the players were understanding a key point then you have to keep working with them. Don't just say box ticks, move on to the next one because my diary says I should be doing this on a Tuesday. No, the players so have you, you've, to learn. So you've got, you've got your plan, but you've got to have that flexibility Absolutely. to step forward if they're better than expected or, or to regress slightly if they're not quite good enough. Absolutely spot on. And, and to me, that's a, one of the key arts of coaching is knowing when the player is ready to move on uh, and to challenge them in the right way. Um, and, and that's the key for me is understand that this is my plan. This is after to deviate slightly and why I'm deviating. And this is the outcome of that. Uh, and as I say, have your clear targets in place, short, medium and longer term. But what you do, the micro detail within that is the art of coaching. And how important is it to give players responsibility to go and learn for themselves? You know, I'd, I've been around a, a lot of football, a lot of academy. My kids are through the system. We tend to be producing, for want of a better word, almost a lot of robots at times. You know, academy players, they're great if they're told what to do and when. Do we, do we need to give players more responsibility to learn for themselves at times? I think if you look at the young, so the young England national squad, for example, there's a, a great depth of talent coming through at all age groups now and the success at 17s, 19s, 20s, 21s, etc. tells you that 
there's a real pool of talent being developed. So there's a lot of outstanding work being done through the academies, you know, the roles of the various partners and the ECCP, et cetera. So a lot of good work's being done, but you, the, the level of the game is getting higher and higher. The game is getting quicker and fast. Decision-making process is getting ever quicker. So we have to challenge these players, Danny, I think, in before they reach the first team. That's the key. They've got to be, they've got to be confronted with a variety of challenge, a quality of challenge, which best prepares them for that first team experience. It can't be right, you know. You can't be right that you step into a first team and the first time you face a, a young Aguero type centre forward is is in the first team. You should have hopefully have played him through at 16, 17, 18, 19. Is, is some of the problem, and I, but this is my belief. You might disagree, um, and, and feel free to. Sometimes when young players step into the first team environment, they almost stop getting coached a lot of their time because obviously everything is about winning. Everything is about the first team, and sometimes their development can slow down a little bit because they're not maybe getting the one-to-one -one in the sessions that they need because it is just about winning and, and the first team games. I think now, with even the change of title, the you know, managers becoming head coaches, I think you, you're now seeing, and go back to your earlier question about technical director, where certain responsibilities can be taken away and allowing the, the manager to focus on his coaching abilities. I think the young players are being coached. You're dead right. There's a danger that you can leave this coaching environment of an academy, for example, up to 23s, and suddenly you're in the first team. It's all about the result on a Saturday. Uh, it's getting that balance right. But I, I believe more and more. You look around at managers in the Premier League, for example, in the Championship, so much good coaching work is being done into these young players. I think the game has moved on significantly from maybe five, eight, ten years ago. So that you're right, you have to watch that and be aware of that potential danger. But I think a lot of good work is being done with these with these young players now. Still talking about sort of young players. Uh, every single coach will always have problem players. Um, you work with one in particular. I sat next to him for four years, uh, Joey Barton. You know, challenges every single day in terms of attitude and whatever. But how do you? What would be your advice to give to any coaches where you get a disruptive influence within the team you know how, how do you deal with that do you take them out do you arm round them what's the best way to deal with any player that's some sort of attitude problem or slightly disruptive to the session I think you've got to look at it what, what age group of player you're working with so if it's a, a younger player for example 13 14 at a local team and your job is to help him now if, 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 if they're beyond help with you or you don't possess the skills to help this particular individual then obviously you, you hope very much you're aware enough to to make the right decision but I think at this more senior level now, it's all down to your recruitment. It's all down to doing your due diligence and your homework and asking the key questions and hoping there's a relationship there. But sometimes these players with the edge are the type of players you're looking for. They add that edge to your team performance on the pitch as well. Uh, and yes, they may be they may challenge you on many aspects, but it can be very good for your management as well. You know, it's part of your experience building uh, and your knowledge building. How do I deal with him? What do I do well? What could I have done better? You know, where where was a key mistake for me? It's just life experiences, Danny. So I think you have to make sure that... <coughs> is, is that the hardest thing about coaching, management, whatever you want to call it? Is it the, the man management these days of, of individuals? Is, is that the hardest aspect at the top level that you've got to get right? I think we've spoken previously, you and I, about the that is the key skill. I look at Man City now to have so many players, world-class players, not involved on a Saturday or Tuesday. That's fan all credit to Pep Guardiola to, to deal with that because I think I hear coaches say, oh, I love being on the grass. Well, that's almost the easy part in some way, in some respects, in the fact that everyone loves doing that and you can go on the grass, you're doing what you enjoy doing best. The man management off the pitch, dealing with the individual players, understanding what makes them tick, understanding that one might have a you know, domestic issue to deal with or a sickness in the family or a divorce or whatever it may be, you've got to understand it because you're dealing at the highest level, professional sportsmen, and, and you've got to make sure that when, when they go out and they cross the white line, their head, their body's in the best place for them to deliver a performance, and, and that's your role, man managing to give them the best environment to maximise their, their abilities. And I guess that filters all the way right down to, to grassroots coaches, whereas at professional level you're dealing with players, entourages, agents, managers, PR people, whatever, lawyer, whoever it is. As you drop down, it becomes about parents, you know, and, and family members that you have to deal with and understand, like you said, if they've got any sort of problems going on behind the scenes away from the football. Yeah, for a young coach, you spoke about how, how does a young coach aspire to become a full-time guy in the game or, or lady in the game. And, and that's very much in dealing with those experiences, dealing with the problem parent, setting the rules and setting the standards within your, within your club. doesn't matter if it's under nines, under 15s, under 18s. What are the standards that you demand, uh, expect, uh, levels of respect that you expect from the players and the parents, boys and girls, 
they're your standards and that's what you stand by and they, whether they're in place at under 13 local park or at a first team in, in the championship it doesn't matter they're your standards and you've got to abide by them and I think players of all levels want want to know the boundaries they want to know how far they can push it you know the, the old saying of the, the guys earlier is players hate rules the one thing they hate worse than that is no rules they want structure they want that clear guidelines and I think if you give it to them make sure you adhere it to it as well well, there you go. Thank you very much, Mark. You've been an absolute star. Some incredible advice from a, an incredibly knowledgeable perspective and slightly different perspective as well, uh, which has been fantastic. So good luck with whatever role you decide to next, whether that be sporting director, manager, coach, running the country, sorting Brexit <laughs> out, whatever it may be. Good luck with it. Many thanks indeed. Appreciate it, Danny. Thank you. Many thanks to Mark for joining us for the third episode in season two of the Coach Manual podcast. Thanks to everyone for listening. You can keep up to date with The Coach Emmanuel on social media. Follow us on Twitter, at Coach Emmanuel. On Instagram and Facebook, at The Coach Emmanuel. Register for an account now for session planning tools, high-quality coaching content, and more essential resources for football coaches at thecoachemmanuel.com. See you next time.